Today on Lockdown Canadians, the Laval Rocket recap, a preview of the Arizona Coyotes game, and we're going to look around the division and try really hard not to read too much into it, but still be smug when the occasion calls for it. And that's all coming up on today's Locked On Canadians. Locked On Canadians, your daily podcast on the Montreal Canadiens, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to episode 609 of Locked On Canadians. My name is Laura Saab, also known as The Active Stick, and I'm joined, as always, by Scott Madlow of Habs Eyes on the Prize, who was watching and covering the Rocket game at the time that we're recording this on Wednesday night. Scott, how are you doing, and how was that game? It was good. It was so good we went back in time 100 episodes. Um I said 709. You said six. Oh, no. Okay, so we are at 709. Oh, my God. Uh, we were having this conversation before we started recording. I am not in any way inebriated. I'm, in fact, simply tired. And the designer bags, the Prada bags under my eyes are still there. Uh, as you will see, hopefully, they'll, they'll have dissipated by tomorrow's episode. Um, in the meantime, I just I want to say thanks to everybody who's been bearing with me and my chronic tiredness as of late. Uh, particularly my co-host. So it is episode 709. There was a Rocket game tonight, though I was not imagining that part. No, you were not. And it was actually a pretty strong showing for the Rocket, who I don't think have played overly badly this season. Um, they are now 1-1-1 one, one, and one on the season. Their overtime loss was one they could have just as easily won, and things got out of hand in the game they lost to the Belleville Senators last Saturday. Tonight, not a high-scoring game. 2 nothing. one empty net goal, one goal by Gabriel Bork. But across the board, it was a much more um, cohesive effort. Uh, there wasn't a lot of the lapses and issues that we saw in uh, the previous games last week. And a lot of that came down to the prospects are playing very well for the Rocket right now. And the veterans are leading the way, as we kind of expected. But the prospects are more than holding their own in the system right now. And... Uh, there's a couple of names I wanted to uh, pick out here. And the first being Matthias Norlinder, who I talked about a little bit after the game on Twitter, is that around this time last year, getting into this, he was sitting on the bench uh, in three on three overtime with Dominique Ducharme on the bench, playing like seven and a half, eight minutes a night, and then was sent down to the rocket and just kind of looked adrift, not really, you know, making the most of what his opportunity could have been. He went back to Sweden, recovered from his injuries that he came joined the Rocket back last year. But this year, so far with the Rocket, he looks like an entirely different player. He's not as playing as confidently as he did when he was hitting his peak uh, with Frolunda. But I look at him making plays and he's taking chances. And the biggest issue I had with his game last year watching him is defensively, his coverage was kind of suspect. He was a little bit easy to be bullied off the puck. Jean-Francois who will put him out there on the first wave to defend against the extra attacker of the Springfield Thunderbirds tonight. A couple of big blocks, a timely clear. And that just that pairing that he had with Tordello uh, going into overtime there really, really just, you know, more than held its own or not overtime, but against the extra attacker held its own. And his development is a good thing because it's going to get crowded soon. Like we said, when Matheson and Edmondson are healthy, Guys are going to come down into the AHL here, and that's not a – that's going to happen. They can't carry extra bodies in the NHL because you have a, a roster limit. Uh, Matthias Norlinder is doing very well to hold his spot right now. Corey Schoenman will likely be back. Arbor Jack, I will likely come down at some point. They may send Jordan Harris if they're trying to make cap things work, this or that. He's doing everything he can to hold that spot right now, and I think that's important. I'm not saying he's going to be jumping into the NHL anytime soon, at least in the next couple weeks kind of thing, but if he keeps playing like this, there's no reason why he can't be in that Chris Weidman role for the Canadians uh, up in the NHL. And that's exactly what I wanted to bring up, is that in the offseason, what I had noticed in, among the discourse, and it's something that as podcasters, you know, we're not just reading our own comments, we're monitoring what's going on on the internets, um, is that people had kind of penciled him out of the Canadian's future 
they kept talking about him as the odd man out or a trade piece. Do you think that that's changed three games into the Rocket season? I, I think with all and prospects... The, and let, I guess let's talk about the preseason as well. Like overall, the preseason plus the Rocket season, how's he been doing? It, the, the thing is, uh, watching with the rookie tournament, nervous, got better. Preseason didn't really do anything to cover himself in glory, so to speak. And he was one of the first early cuts to the Laval Rocket, which is fine because that's where he should be right now. Defensemen take time to hit their next level. I look at someone like Jonathan Kovacevic, who's been in the AHL for a while now, and is seemingly doing pretty well holding down a top six spot for the Canadians. I'm more than willing to be patient with Matthias Norlander because if they allow him to develop into what he can be, that's a huge bonus for the Canadians. They don't have they don't have a reason to rush him this year. They can let him marinate the way that he needs to, and he is getting better. I, I do think, and the biggest thing is his defensive reads are getting much better. Even when he makes a mistake, his play getting back into it to try and defend against things is getting so much better. Mistakes don't result in everything falling apart. He's got more composure to him. And I guess part of that is he knows he's here. That He's not, you know, torn between going back to Europe and this or that is he is here right now. And I do want to give another shout out to uh, Jesse Ullinen, who I think continues to be someone who should be in the NHL right now. I'm, I'm just going to come out and say it. Mike Hoffman should not be holding a spot that should be going to Jesse Ullinen right now is I watch him play and he still can score from distance very easily. Slap shot, wrist shot. He can do that, but he's choosing to diversify his shot selection. He's being more aggressive in that. He's taking more chances. He's not overpassing it. He's cutting into dangerous areas. And against Springfield tonight, he could have had two or three goals. He clanged a couple off the posts, got a couple blocked or big saves by Joel Hoffer of the Thunderbirds. I'm seeing the growth in him in his overall game that makes me confident that he could be in the NHL very soon. If they can find takers for a Druan, for a Hoffman, for an Armia, for whomever, Jesse Ullinen should be in this lineup right now. I think he brings exactly what Martin St. Louis wants. And yeah, you're okay with some of the defensive lapses because he's still developing. It's not like a veteran who is what they are at this point. And speaking of who is what they are at this point, the Canadians do have a game. It is, I don't know if I would call it a tank bowl anymore because the Canadians aren't <laughs> outwardly or actively tanking. Uh, so we're going to talk about a preview of the game against the Arizona Coyotes. And that's all coming up in just one moment but first you know the drill but i'm still gonna tell you because bet online really should be the only place that you're going for your betting football and basketball hockey all of your sports betting needs you're gonna find all the latest player developments team matchups news podcasts and in-depth analysis on every single game it's it, as always Bet online remains your continued source for all your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport out there, including ours. I mean, I know a lot of people are excited about the beginning of the season. There's tons to be betting on right now. And bet online is going to be where you do that. It is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, including major league baseball, MMA, boxing, golf, you name it. They've got it. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. Bet online is where the game starts. All right. So the Canadians have a game. It's been a couple of days off. We're all out of our rhythm. You know, who is especially out of the rhythm is the Toronto Maple Leafs. And we're going to talk about that in our third segment. But right now, <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about this quote unquote tank bowl. The Canadians are not tanking. They want a high draft pick, but they're not tanking. I mean, they're not tanking yet. Um, I, I think I, they're actively trying to win games is the thing. I mean, yeah, because they can play well because, you know, their coach isn't a schmuck at this point. Uh, la here's the thing about this. The vibes for this game are making me so uncomfortable that I can't quite figure out what to expect. The Toronto game did nothing to help that because Arizona looking at their roster is a bunch of who the hell is that guy on that team here? And you know who the Canadians love giving up goals to who the hell is that guy guys all the time? Absolutely all the time in the games against Arizona last year too. 
they played well and lost because they are bad and or were bad this year. I th- they should win. They should, but I cannot help but feel like we had that great performance against Pittsburgh. By the way, here comes that Detroit follow up game. Here, the vibes for this are they are off. They are sketchy. They are sus. Whatever you want to put it, I cannot feel comfortable going into this game because the Habs are either going to win by four or lose by four. There will be no in between in this game between these two teams. Oh, I thought if it was going to be a loss, it would be 6-1. So (laughs) you've got a little bit more faith than I do. I mean, you know, they have injured defensemen. But the thing that I did not anticipate is how much of a factor Caden Gooley was going to be so fast. I think... think Sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, you know, and and again, like I do care about what our listeners think, and, and a lot of them did think that we were a bit harsh uh, with David Savard, and I, I I would I would think that you you have a point, um, but we did qualify what we said with it's not his fault, right? He's doing the best he can with what he's been given, but somebody who's really elevated that pairing is the guy that you know David Savard is mentoring, so at least there's something that's going right there. And, you know, today I excitedly sent Scott a quote about Caden Gooley and I'm going to continue to bring him up. Um, He's definitely somebody who he showed up. And I I think, I think from last year, after last year's training camp, he decided I'm ready to be in the NHL and he's playing like he's ready to be in the NHL. And it's not like he's never making mistakes. Like that's not it. Mistakes are important. You're going to grow from them. You're going to learn from them. You know, a bad mistake is one that costs you a playoff spot or like the Stanley Cup, right? But at the end of the day, the mistakes that you're making in a tanking season or not tanking season or whatever, a throwaway season, I guess, a growing season. Oh, we're going to call it growing. We're going to call it growing, God. Um, A growing season. The mistakes that you made, that that you make are building blocks. They're not fatal. Uh, And so I'm not seeing even that many mistakes from him. Like the way that he's playing is aggressively poised um and and i am excited to see you know just how he develops over the course of this year but i feel like the defense is no longer an empty black hole i think it's still a question mark there's still so many things to be answered whether it's who they decide to play who comes back from injury who gets sent down to laval whether or not kane gooley should you know get experience in laval or not um if he's con- going to continue getting top line pairing minutes in in the nhl why would you send him down uh so i i feel a bit more confident than i did prior to the season i don't think that you know they, they didn't play all that well against against detroit or or uh washington, washington. They didn't, you know, like as a team, they weren't that great, but they were better than we thought they would be overall in the first few games of the season. Yeah. And like, I'm looking at the Coyotes lineup. It's Clayton Keller, Travis Boyd, and Lawson Krause is their top line. Uh, Nick Ritchie, Barrett Hayton, Dylan Genther, Matthias McKelly, Jack McBain, Zach Cassian, Liam O'Brien, Nick Bugstead, Christian Fisher on defense, Giannis Mosier, Troy Stetcher, Shane Gostisbehere, Josh Brown, Yusuf Alamaki and Dyson Mayo. And for some of those names, Josh Brown was one of the worst defensemen in the NHL last year. And he's playing second pairing minutes. This is a team that, yeah, the Canadians probably want to be bad, but I look at what Chicago's roster looks like. And I look at what this roster looks like. This is a game that the Canadians shouldn't. I know that we want to finish in the bottom five, top three, whatever you want to call it. This is not a game you can lose. You got it. We talked about building blocks after that Pittsburgh game a little bit. This is another building block game. Figure out if you can get the power play working here. Try and incorporate and get some of those other guys off the schneid. Can you get Evgeny Dodonov a goal now that Kirby Doc has scored? Can you uh, get Josh Anderson on track? Can you get the fourth line? Is this the game where Slavkovsky scores his first NHL goal or gets his first NHL point? The opportunity is there for Martin St. Louis and the coaching staff to exploit what is legitimately not a very good looking lineup. And I know I am saying this and they will probably blow it up in my face because that's how this works. But the opportunities are there for them to experiment and try things in this, especially if they get up with a lead here, give Slavkovsky more ice time, you know, let Arbor Jack, I, you know, take on some of those tough guys out there. There will be a point that I'm sure Arbor Jack, I and Zach Cassian will come together because that is just two combustible elements It'll be hilarious and everyone will be freaking out about it on Twitter, myself included. But 
it's a it's a very good litmus test. Can you avoid falling off after a big win every single time? And can you build on what you've already done? Uh, I think Marty will have the guys ready to go. I don't think that they're going to take this lightly. Uh, I'm curious to see if there's any lineup changes of Rem Pitlick or moving people around. I don't expect so, but I, I want to see them, you know, use this game as to try things, especially if they are winning big uh, early on. I agree that they want to, or they should want to give Slavkovsky a little bit more ice time. Uh, it hasn't really been his fault, the the number of minutes that he's been playing. And I do think that he, he does need to get a little bit more exposure. Let me ask you this before we move, on, we move on to our next segment. Besides, let's not talk about Slavkovsky. Besides him, who do you want to see a big game from against Arizona? Uh, Brendan Gallagher or uh, Evgeny Dodonov would be quite nice, I think. Um, Dodonov played a lot better against Pittsburgh, I thought, and so did Gallagher. Uh, Gallagher's been very, very good this season, I think, and he's been unlucky to not be further on the score sheet. Uh, and I'd like to see, you know... I'd like to see another strong game legitimately from the Gouli Savard pairing. And I think they can do that. Uh, but forward wise, I'd like to see Evgeny Dodonov and Brendan Gallagher get on the score sheet in this one. I can't disagree with that. I think, um, you know, if, if, if the fan base is anything to go by, there's a little bit of, um, you know, whatever the equivalent is of holding your stick too tight uh, about both of those players. And finally, we are going to go around the division and do a division check-in, not because we think that there's going to be a major factor over the course of the overall rankings, but it's still kind of fun to discuss some things. And that's coming up in just one moment. So let's take a look at the Atlantic division. Scott, shall we save the best for last? Uh, no, I want to get this out of the way first because it's funny. Uh, Toronto <laughs> is in complete implosion mode, and it has been four games. The coach has called his team's performances unacceptable after losing to the Habs. They won two games in a row where fans then decided Justin Hall is good again, and then they lost to the Arizona Coyotes where the coach said, we have elite players who need to play at an elite level after they lost, and also Justin Hall is now a bum who should not be allowed to set foot on the ice it is game four, and Toronto is eating itself alive. And here's the thing is, I assume they're just going to get over this early season hump and turn it around and be good for the rest of the year because they have too much talent to do so. But right now, there is a panic in that fan base that, like, they after last year's loss in the playoffs, we were so close again. We're sticking with it. We're going to go for it again. And then here we are. We lost to the Arizona Coyotes. What? Like losing to the Habs, bad enough. Rival, bad rival. Opening night, you follow it up. It was three one. It was three one, and then you follow it up with two much better performances. Not perfect, but better. You lose your starting goalie; he's injured. Jake Muzzin is out. Timothy Lilligren still out. Austin Matthews has not scored a goal yet this season, and then you lose to the Arizona Coyotes at home. That's about as rough a start as you can get for a team that, again, is picked by many to be the off-season champion, to be crowned before the season came in, and it's just, it's not there. And I'm not saying the Habs are going to finish better than the Leafs. I hope they don't because the Leafs don't need any more elite talent through the draft in their pool here, but uh, there's a panic, and people are very, very on edge here. It, like everything is under a microscope now. We're in what year six of Kyle Dubas, six or seven, whatever it is. Results do matter. And right now, uh, these are not the returns you're looking for for a team that was within a goal of finally getting over their boogeyman in the first round. And here they are. And you look at everyone else in the division has gotten better or is still dangerous. And Toronto is stumbling out of the gate. They're tied with the Habs in the standings right now. And take a look at how those two teams were compared this offseason. Um, I think it goes without saying that Sheldon Keefe is on the hottest seat and then followed by Kyle Dubas and then followed by, I guess, Brendan Shanahan. Here's my question is, would you consider Brendan Shanahan to be on the hot seat at all or not? No, uh, I think Brendan Shanahan's probably on the coldest seat out of the three there. Sheldon Keefe's sh uh, seat should have been on fire go after they lost to the Habs in the first place. Uh, like I've talked to people who watched him with the Marlies and a lot of the thought is a lot of his success comes from having elite players to execute when his systems don't work. 
what are you going to do with the NHL level here? And the, my thought is, here's the thing is that they fire him. Are they going to coax Barry Trotz out of retirement? Which is terrifying because Barry Trotz, very good defensive coach. The Leafs with a truly lockdown defense and that kind of offense is horrifying to me. And I hope that is not the case. Um, but if they don't get it together here, Sheldon Keefe will be fired before the new year starts. And if they're really bad, Dubas won't finish the year. Uh, like, I don't think it's going to come to that, but I do think Sheldon Keefe is a losing streak away from being fired. And if Kyle Dubas isn't willing to do that, I don't think he's going to be long behind him at that point. But we are four games in. We are four games in. This can all change in a week, and they could go on a four-game winning streak by then. So This does have all, have, have all the makings of that, though, right? Like that early season adversity, that, that conversation that we're having. And then Barry Trotz, for a reason, did not sign in the offseason because he has a chance to to sign with a real true contender if he just waited it out. Like there, there's a lot of coaches that need to perform or um, they're, they're going to get fired. And so he's going to end up having his pick. And I think if you're Barry Trotz, you take that Toronto knowing what you have and you're able to pull a contender out of them. And, and that to me, like it, it feels like a fairy tale season kind of thing. Or like one of those, you know, those historic ones. Uh, I just, I, I hope it doesn't happen. I hope they keep Sheldon Keefe just a little too long. And I look at their schedule. They play the Dallas Stars the day you were hearing this on Thursday. They play the Jets on Saturday. They play the Golden Knights on Monday, the 24th. They play the Sharks in San Jose. They play the Kings in LA. And they play the Ducks in Anaheim. That is the rest of their October schedule. Every single one of those games is winnable for them. And I'm it's the start of it that's the hardest part. And then I think some they can end it strong uh, against the Sharks, the Kings, and the Ducks. But who it's uh it doesn't get much easier beyond that because then beyond that it's the Flyers who are suddenly very, you know, decent. The Bruins, the Hurricanes, the Golden Knights again, Penguins, the Canucks, the Penguins, the Devils, the Sabres, the Islanders, the Devils, the Wild. Like it doesn't get any easier in the NHL. And I'm very curious how they respond. And I realize we've spent a lot of time talking about the Leafs here and I want to shift to someone else we should be rooting for to lose in the Atlantic division. Uh, the Florida Panthers who placed Aaron Eckblad on long-term injured reserve today, which is a very good thing. If you're a Montreal Canadiens fan, because he's their number one defender, their number two defender was traded to Calgary uh, Mackenzie Weger in the trade for Matthew Kachuk. And what that means is guys like Gustav Forsling, uh, uh, Radko Gudis, et cetera, are playing a lot of minutes and the Canadians have their unprotected first round pick in this upcoming draft. To me, uh, they did beat the Flyers tonight, which boo, whatever, fine. But uh, Florida is a team that is lacking team defense. Yeah, they can score, but if the defense of Bobrovsky are bad, uh, Kent Hughes and everyone in Canadians land is very, very happy all of a sudden. And that's really a thing. We knew Florida was going to take a step back from last year. Um, and when I say step back, I mean regular season. The playoffs did leave a lot to be desired, but I mean they finished the season at the top of the top of the league. I think that I think that it was to be expected with with who they lost, particularly um, behind the bench, and who they lost on the ice. Uh, and that's not even factoring in the Ekblad injury, right? So I knew that they would take a step back, but I still thought that they would be in the top three in the division. That was my prediction at the beginning, and I'm, I'm not ready to rule it out just yet, but it does provide an opportunity for the teams like Detroit and Ottawa to kind of push for a playoff spot, uh, which I don't want particularly, but I'm just saying, you know, for, for a Canadians fan, you're sitting pretty. So speaking of Detroit and Ottawa, uh, Detroit is looking much better than they were last year, which was to be expected. It is very early in the season, and I know that last season – at the beginning of the season, Detroit Red Wings fans had a lot of fun, right? Like they had their young and their young, exciting players were were really kind of coming into their own. Um, and now they're they're expected to kind of push for a playoff spot. They're not contending, and I don't think anybody has any illusions about that. They want to make the playoffs. They still haven't added those pieces that you know those final pieces that they would either trade draft picks for, uh, or will come up through their system, or will will take a step forward next year. But I do think that Detroit is a really, really good threat um, to teams like Florida. The other wild card is the Ottawa Senators, because I thought that they made the best moves over the course of the offseason. 
There's no denying that. Getting to Brinkett was a steal. Uh, he's a phenomenal player. Claude Giroux is the kind of player that they needed. Uh, but I still want to see them lose every game. Yeah, and here's the thing about it is they're going to give their fans heart attacks because I watched the game against the Bruins last night. They went up 3 nothing very easily, and then they let the game be tied very easily. It was a high-scoring affair. They can score at will. They remind me of what the older Leafs teams look like before they got and added some defensive pieces is that they will pile pucks into your net, but you can be sure that you can go the other way and score on them. Yeah, Anton Forsberg is likely better than advertised. Yes, they're missing Cam Talbot, who was their expected starter due to an injury, but the defense doesn't blow me away, and it hasn't been where it needs to be for where this team needs to succeed. Giroux, Dabrinkit, Batherson, Norris, Stutzla, Pinto, all these guys are very good, but they trotted out Derek Broussard at 2C last night. And then they had their coach saying, we're gonna, we're not going to hard match. Mark Kastelik's going to play against Patrice Bergeron. What's the worst that could happen? It's Patrice Bergeron. A lot of bad things can happen here. And there are times that it feels like the coach might be holding them back a little bit. They have all this talent and they bleed goals. And they did last year too. They could score a lot and their power play was great last year. I their defense is going to be that thing that potentially holds them back. And the same could be said for the Habs, maybe not to the same degree on offense, but there's, there's definite things that are going to hold them back a little bit. Detroit might be goaltending Ottawa might be their defense Toronto. It might be being forever cursed by some very angry wizard that you bothered in the woods one day, Buffalo Sabres still developing their defense and goaltending, et cetera. Every team has a flaw except maybe Tampa and Tampa's might just be, yeah, we went on three deep cup runs. We're tired. Like, what are you going to do about it? So now the Atlantic's still good. And I'm not saying the Canadians are going to, you know, climb out of the cellar this year, but the, the times are waning here a little bit, the old guard. And I say old, like there's not, you know, a bunch of young guys waiting there. It's changing. And you're going to see a new crop of these young stars rising up here. And the power balance is going to shift from Tampa, Toronto, Boston to, Ottawa, potentially Buffalo, hopefully Montreal in the future here. And that's happening so far this season. There are no easy outs, so to speak. An easy out for me, though, is that we are at the end of this episode. Uh, So we are going to obviously cover the game and we're going to have a mailbag. So please do not forget to send your mailbag questions. You can send them to uh, our Twitter account, LO underscore Canadians. You can email them to us at LockedOnCanadians at gmail.com. You can leave them in the YouTube comments. If you're mean to anybody in there, we're going to delete your comment and say bye to you forever. Um, and in the meantime, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcast, as well as on YouTube. Um, and also when you're done checking us out, check out Locked On Fantasy Hockey. This is the time to build your fantasy team. It's pretty early. Who should you trade for? Who should you keep on the bench? They've got all of that. So thank you so much for listening to us today. We will be back tomorrow.